All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us today um, and for joining with Advantage Kentucky Alliance for our Lunch and Learn webinar. We're glad to have each one of you um, here with us. I would like to start with a brief introduction um, to Advantage Kentucky Alliance. We, let's see if I can get this, there we go. Um, Advantage Kentucky Alliance is the official representative of the Manufacturing Extension Partnership uh, National Network here in Kentucky. We are focused on helping small and medium-sized manufacturers thrive in today's technology-driven economy. And we help our manufacturers become more globally competitive so that they can retain and even create additional industry and jobs within the state of Kentucky. And we offer expertise, training, and facilitated planning to help identify areas of improvement, streamline processes, increase competitiveness, and create new revenue streams for your businesses. So um, Advantage Kentucky Alliance has received CARES Act funding to help alleviate impacts from COVID-19 to Kentucky manufacturers. This funding allows us to provide no cost services uh, to manufacturers around Kentucky. And some of these no cost services include maintenance assessments, operational assessments, um, supply risk assessments, as, long as, as well as health and safety gap analysis and a COVID-19 reopening audit. So if you're interested in learning more about any of these services, you can go to it, our website at advantageky.org. We also, um, or you can email me and I'm happy to give you more information. Uh, we have with us the AME group today. Uh, Mr. Um, Joe Donaher is our, is our speaker. He is the senior security analysis at the AME group. Joe co-founded an IT company called Integrity IT in 2000, and they were acquired by the AME group in October, 2019. Uh, Joe continues to provide leadership in all aspects of IT with a focus on risk mitigation using threat hunting, incident response, and log analysis to keep customers' data and networks secure. And today he will talk about how cyber threats to businesses have accelerated in 2020 and what we should be doing to respond to these threats. So please feel free to ask questions, make comments. Um, you're welcome to use the chat feature. And just so you know, we will be recording today's webinar and we'll send it out to anyone who is interested in it. So I will go ahead and turn the time over to Mr. Donahair and the AME group. Thank you. Well, thank you, Kim. Appreciate that uh, introduction. Uh, thanks everybody for uh, joining uh, today. And uh, just wanna get started here by trying not to scare you to death to talk about this topic, but it is a pretty intimidating uh, topic that we're gonna that we're gonna cover here. Um, so I'm just trying to make sure that I can share this here. Okay, give me just a second to make sure I can share this out because uh, I think I was uh, Okay. All right, so sorry about that. I did not really expect to be presenting from my screen, but uh, there we are. Um, so just to talk about um, cybercrime a little bit, my job is to try to be the defender, right? I'm, I'm usually the what they call the blue team. So we try to defend networks and data from cyber criminals. 
that is increasingly a difficult task. Um, and there's several reasons why. Um, and they may surprise you, right? Um, cyber crime these days are really two groups. It's really organized criminals, right? It's not people just working out of a basement somewhere. These are people that are well-financed. They're typically located in Eastern Europe or Asia, and they are well-funded. Uh, they go to work just like we do nine to five, only they're, they're trying to steal information and then also extort people out of uh, money by, uh, you know, installing ransomware and encrypting their systems. So the focus though has been uh, turned towards small and medium business. And why? Well, there's a large number of targets, right? There's a, there's a lot a larger group of small and medium businesses that are available to attack. And cyber criminals also, they're, they're sophisticated enough to know that these businesses, they don't have a large budget to spend on security controls, right? Whether they be technical controls or physical controls, they just do not have that budget that some of the larger targets like like banks, for example, uh, is, a, is a good example of, of somebody who really spends a lot of money on cybersecurity. And they also leverage that, you know, as part of that uh, security expense, that they're not providing a lot of training for their staff on how to recognize an attack. And, uh, you know, so they, they count on that as well. But the bottom line is most cyber criminals are motivated by money. Now you have another side of that, which you're seeing as we move into, you know, full speed into the election, there are nation state actors. So there are, there are groups that are either funded directly or indirectly by governments in Russia and China are two big examples. And they're trying, they're doing state sponsored attacks on government entities, but also on businesses that provide like Department of Defense contractors, for example, because they're looking maybe not so much money, they're looking at what data and what proprietary intellectual information they can actually steal from the United States. So those are the two groups that are really involved in most of the attacks that we happen to see every day in our, our work. Let's see, I'm gonna see if we can move along. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so how do people, how, how do these cyber criminals operate? What are they really using to attack small and medium businesses, right? So we call this open source uh, intelligence type attacks, right? They're depending on end users to not be trained on how to recognize some of this. And then just on human nature, most people want to be helpful. Most people, if you're presented with a deadline or a sense of urgency, even in an email, right? We try to get to that email first. We, we want to respond. That's just preying on human nature. And they know this, these criminals know this. So what are we seeing on my side of the fence where I'm trying to defend against these attacks? And what we're seeing is most attacks on small and medium businesses, they begin with an email, right? So it's usually sent to uh, somebody that has maybe some HR tasks or some C-level position or that deals with the money right? Payroll. So those are, those are the very likely targets of these attacks, but you know, that's known as phishing, right? So I send an email, I could be posing as someone else. I could be, uh, you know, the, the pretext is you've got something urgent that you need to do, click this link or click on this file, right? And as soon as you do that, if you don't have certain controls in place like malware defense on your computer. And even if you do, if it's not fully patched, 
what can happen is that malware can execute. And so, you know, that's how they deliver like ransomware. So ransomware it essentially encrypts the data. That's what it does. That's its payload because what it's what they're trying to do is get you to pay for them to decrypt it. So that's why it's called ransomware. They hold your data for ransom. So what we what we have seen though is those attacks are growing in sophistication to the point where the attacker will get access to your computer and not execute ransomware immediately, they first try to extract data that they can use to leverage and get you to pay. Hey, we're going to release your, this spreadsheet of all your customers' data or all your employees' you know, social security numbers, right? We're going to release that if you don't pay us. So they, a lot of times they're, that's called exfiltration. They're trying to steal this data from you before they deliver their ransomware that encrypts your data. So they've gotten much better at crafting these emails to make them look like the real thing. We, what we see a lot, um, people uh, give away credentials. So Office 365 is a big target. Many of you may have moved to that email platform. It's very popular with small and medium businesses. But it's also really easy these days to craft an email that looks exactly like Office 365 sign-in. And it looks like the email came from Microsoft, so it must be okay, right? It's got their logo. They can even fake the from address and make it look to appear like it comes from Microsoft support and say, hey, you're about to lose access to your account. You've got to confirm your username and password. There's a link. It looks like your link that you log, in, log into Office 365, but they've just stolen your credentials. Because Microsoft, if you, what, one thing training helps with, you know they'll never ask for credentials in that manner. But if you haven't been trained, you don't know that. There are some tricks where you can actually hover the email address and, and uh, we'll get into that in just a minute. But that's what we're seeing as far as how the attacks start, how companies, small, medium businesses are being breached, right? That we're seeing a really increase in that uh, this year, to be honest. Um, so just an example, a couple examples to show you how sophisticated these emails have gotten and, and you know what they look like, right? So this looks, this looks legitimate, right? This looks okay. You know, if I don't hover with my mouse, I don't really see the from address. I just see what they want you to see. So if you, if you would open this email on a mobile device, you don't have that luxury of being able to hover. So that's one trick where you can uncover who it's actually from. And a lot of times they will, they will fake this, what you see, but who it's actually from will be an email that has nothing to do with Microsoft. That's one tip off. Um, the other tip is any link that I can make this text in the link. I can make it say anything. So if you don't hover with your mouse, you don't know where this link is really taking you. And you may not be in a habit when you click those links to look up in your browser address bar and see, am I really at you know, office.com, where am I really at? So otherwise, they make this look very legitimate, right? It's really easy for me to get a logo of Microsoft and slap it in there. Real easy for me to put this, this type of professional looking verbiage. So, and, and also what they've gotten more sophisticated with because a tip off is if it's a generic greeting, like high end user or high customer, you, it's less believable. So what they do is they buy your email address and name from lists where you that have been breached, right? So they got your email address. Another easy thing to do is if any of you are on LinkedIn, right? That's like the hacker's phone book. I can find your email address there pretty easily. Or some of you probably for business purposes, you have it on your website, right? That's not uncommon. So it's not difficult to make this look a little more professional than in the past. And the link takes you 
Well, if I'm not paying attention, well, this looks like my login. I'm just going to go ahead and, and put in my credentials like they said without ever looking at the address up here that it's not really office.com, right? A lot of people don't inspect that closely. They maybe see that logo, but they're really focused on the middle of the screen here. So that's how sophisticated these attacks are in stealing your credentials. And you think, okay, you know, what's the big deal? They get in my email, I, you know, I just have to change my email address. Well, one of the thing, couple of things they do when they get in your email, they harvest your contacts list. So then they can send it out to all of your contacts. And remember, you've given them your username and password. They can send it as you. It looks like it is essentially coming from you. Now, Microsoft will shut this down if they detect a large number of emails. They've seen these attacks and they will stop it. But that doesn't mean some of these emails are not sent. So that's one thing to keep in mind. And it is really a good practice with email to have two-factor authentication enabled. In case I fall for this and I just have a username and password, at least the two-factor authentication protects my email. Because I, I'm sure all of you uh, don't put any sensitive information in email. You probably don't do that. You probably don't attach you know, spreadsheets that have a lot of confidential information. Uh, I'm sure you do, right? Everybody that uses email, kind of it's a de facto file system, if you will. So there's a lot of sensitive data in your email that they can also look at. The other trick they do is they will set up, they will do a search on your email for any finance information. So if you do, if you normally do wire transfers uh, in your business, that's another thing that they will look for because then they'll try to get somebody in your company to do a wire transfer to their bank. So that's a common way they can use these stolen email credentials. Um, I think the, the other example I had was just to show, you know, this is really common right now and it's a terrible, terrible, what's called a Trojan. So this Trojan is called Emotet and it first, uh, we first saw it back in January. It was really just a trying to steal credentials, right? It was what's called a key logger. So if it gets on your computer, essentially anything you type, it will send to the cyber criminal. In July, which happens a lot, this was rewritten by the cyber criminals into it'll deliver a lot more. So besides having a, a key logger, it will also install what's called command and control. That means it will actually open up communication to the bad guys from your computer. So not only can they receive information like files or whatever else they can find, they can also send stuff. So what we're seeing with that is normal antivirus is not really effective at stopping that. So the, the kind of new generation antivirus, uh, it's called uh, endpoint detection and response. We have seen where that will stop this particular uh, piece of malware. But what is really, uh, what really defeats traditional antivirus, traditional antivirus is really depending on detecting malware by the code that's written. And like I said, these criminals have gotten very sophisticated and they can manipulate this code just enough where anti traditional antivirus won't detect it. So your semantics and things like that won't detect it. So if I'm a user and I get this and I'm curious because I'm like, well, I don't know Paul Stevens, but this sounds like, you know, they're going to try to pay me. I'm going to open this file. And as soon as I open that file, it's infected my computer. So that's what we're, that's kind of what we're seeing. Um, so just to, to move on to some different risks for small and medium businesses that we also see and that you, you may not think about, right? So you likely have a lot of third parties you do business with, um, whether they have access into your network where your data is or not, Maybe they do, maybe they don't. But what we're seeing is um, these third parties, depending on what they, what access they have, 
if they're breached, that breach can be passed along to your network pretty easily. We had an example back in August of a company who uh, did some claims processing, right? Some, some healthcare claims processing. So that's some pretty sensitive data. So they had a uh, servers in a very secure data center, but the IT company that was providing support for those servers, they got breached and come to find out they had a, what's called a VPN. So that is a, a secure connection directly from that IT provider, that third party into this environment. So this IT provider got ransomware. So all of their data was encrypted, but since this VPN connection, this connectivity was always on, the customer also got breached. The, the people that were doing healthcare claims, they also got ransomware and the the really difficult part, and this is another lesson too, if you do get ransomware, a couple of things that can save you is a backup, a backup that's not on the network. What happened in this case is they had a backup, it was on the same network, so it got encrypted as well. So they essentially lost 10 months of data, lost. Um, it took about three weeks for them to clean this up and they almost, the, the healthcare uh, contract that they held, they almost lost as a result of a third party breach. They weren't even the ones who were breached initially, right? It wasn't that they were doing anything wrong. So you've got to really, as you enter into these contracts with your third parties, you really need to understand how they're protecting the data that you guys share or the access that they have into your network. You've really got to make sure that's kind of an addendum into your contract where they specify exactly what they're doing. And if they're breached, you know, what, what they're gonna do to, to help clean this up. Because I can tell you this cleanup for, I think it was about nine servers, it, the, the bill was over $30,000. So it's, it's a, you know, it's a really something that you need to pay attention to as a small business person. So what are some things that, you know, what are some things that you guys can do uh, to really, you know, not break the bank, but some simple things that you can do to protect against this. I heard a very sad statistic this week that for every dollar that's spent on, uh, you know, securing your network and keeping secure that the bad guys spend a dollar, their dollar goes much further. So that is, that is the unfortunate place we find ourselves in. However, there's some really simple things small and medium businesses can do to really improve your game and, and protect your data and your network. So yourself, right? Training yourself. You don't, you know, you, if you don't know how to spot some of the things I covered as far as, you know, how to spot a fish or, you know, the techniques that these criminals are using to get to your network and, and you know, uh, cause havoc, then, you know, you're, you're already at a disadvantage. So, because the criminals already know people, that's my easiest target. I got all these you know, they've got all these sophisticated IT controls and firewalls and they've got their, their endpoint detection and, you know, they may have just all kinds of layers of technical security, but with one click that can be defeated, right? So you really want to provide some training and there's a lot of free training resources out there. We're going to talk about um, something that we use and do for folks. And I think there's something available to you guys if you, if you care to do it. But, um, you know, there's a lot of things that are web-based that uh, your staff can go through and really just help them with the basics, right? How do I recognize a fish? What do I do if I get a fish? Uh, you know, how do I make a good password? Some just some basic things that, that really can be done at very low cost. I mean, you have to give your folks time to go through the training, but it, it can even be looked at as a kind of a benefit, uh, you know, an employee benefit because it helps them in their personal life as well. But just some, just some other things to keep in mind, right? As a, sometimes we're engaged to do what's called a penetration test. 
and that's to imitate the bad guys, right? And try to break in networks. So we know this, you know, our people are the weak link. And so we we'll even call people and, you know, say, hey, we're from IT, you know, we uh, trying to work on your machine, but we need your password. You'd be surprised how many times that works, right? People are trusting. Um, I mentioned the hovering with your mouse, right? On an email address and those links in an email, especially if it kind of, uh, even if it's from somebody you know, but it's a little unusual. Like they want you to buy, you know, 20 iTunes gift cards and send them to you, right? That's kind of a little, little offbeat. So, you know, you really want to, to check these things out either by hovering with your mouse or even, I know a lot of us have phones and we don't, we don't use them as phones, but even calling the person, right? Um, we had an incident, to be honest, the end of last week, and somebody had spoofed an email to the, uh, the person who does their direct deposit for, their, uh, for this company. And we have some protections on there that notify them that, hey, this is a, this is a spoof, right? I showed you that earlier where the, the, the from address can appear to be anything. Well, this was from somebody trying to get them to change their direct deposit for their payroll. And, you know, it wasn't legitimate. So, you know, it was good they had that detection, but it's just really important when you get unusual requests, especially when they're financial, whether it's a wire transfer or, you know, like your direct deposit. I know another company that, you know, they were asked for all the W-2 records for their, their employees and they did send them. Um, so, you know, verify that with a, a phone call. You don't want to verify it with an email because you could be talking to the, to the person that's trying to hack you. So, you know, use your phone and just this helps really create a culture of security. If you train your employees and, and kind of push it from the top down, this is one of those things that works really good and gets employees attention. If it's from the C-level folks, right, and not from IT, it, sh it really shouldn't be driven by IT. That makes it a little bit more uh, effective and for employees and really emphasizes that importance. So passwords, right? It's 2020, we all thought we'd have flying cars and not have to use passwords, but here we are. We still have, we don't have flying cars and we still have to use passwords. So um, there was a study a few years ago by the National Institute of Standard and technology. So some of your tax dollars at work missed. And they said, what is the single thing that makes a strong password? And it wasn't, you know, the, uh, back in the early 2000s, it was like, well, we just have to make people change their passwords more often. And they found that actually made them less secure. They found the number one thing to make a strong password is length password length. And for years, I used to work in healthcare. For years, it was six characters. And you should have seen the physicians that would just pull their hair out saying, oh my gosh, you're killing me with these long passwords. Well, get ready because the new recommendations are to use a password that is at least 10 characters long, right? So how do you do that and make it secure? Well, one idea is this passphrase where you put a few words together that really don't make sense together and that aren't really you know revealing personally so not your kids names not the street you live on right but some maybe some hobbies or things you you like um i think that's what i did with the like you, you know your favorite bird or whatever and mix that with a few things um, and why is our passwords still a thing and why are they important? It's because cyber criminals, they're on the dark web, which is, is a real thing. They trade and sell password lists from these breaches that you hear about every day in the news, right? A lot of times companies will store your password in plain text or in, in a very weak encrypted state, which is easily broken. So they have passwords if, you're, if your account has been involved in a breach. And so that is my second point, not to use your work password anywhere else except for work. And I know that, that we do it. And that's a, just a simple rule that helps really make your work password more secure. 
because you don't always know, you're not always notified, hey, was my work email address involved in the, uh, in the LinkedIn breach back in 2016 and I still maybe use that password and I haven't ever changed it because I don't change my passwords. So those are, those are some things to keep in mind as far as your passwords go. And if you're like any average uh, American, you probably have over 60 passwords you have to remember. So that's a lot, that, uh, that taxes our, our brains for sure. And so using password managers, and some are free, some are very low cost, some have kind of like a family option, have some links there to like LastPass as a, as a good example, but um, that can help you write your portable brain. That can help you remember uh, your passwords. Uh, and a lot of times they'll even fill them in on websites and things like that, that you, that you typically use. So that's how you can say, okay, this 10 characters is gonna kill me, but that's one way to kind of mitigate that if you will. So just a little tip there but password security is really important. And you can, uh, you can go on uh, this howsecureismypassword.net and you can do this little test and you can enter a password and see exactly how long it takes to break it, right? Because as a cyber criminal, just like you guys have you know, Word and Excel, as a cyber criminal, I have a tool called Password Cracker. That's actually a thing. You can actually download that from the internet and run it against. Remember, I said that you know some passwords are, have a weak uh, encryption, so it's called a hash. So you can run those list of passwords you have and easily, you know, break that encryption and see what they are in plain text. And so the number of characters, though, is what really slows down those password cracking tools. So as you get, you know, as you get more complex in your password, and as you get more characters, you're getting out to the point where the average, uh, the average cyber criminal is not gonna hang around for five years trying to break your password. They're probably not gonna hang around for a month. But instantly, uh, it's not good. That's not good. Or, uh, you know, uh, an hour, well, that's, that's, you know, reasonable, right? Eight hour a day, sure. So you can see where that number of characters really drives how secure your password is. Um, pretty kind of funny story for this slide. I was uh, asked a couple months ago when school started back, right? Well, we've got all this distance learning. We've given these uh, Chromebooks to all the students and I've got K through 12. And so how, how do I talk to them about passwords? And how do I talk to them about securing, you know, making a secure password? And it, it's, a, it's honestly, it's a conversation you have to have, right? You have, and, and, you know, you have to have, because even at this one school system I worked with, they had kindergartners, right? That were toting these things around and logging in. You know, uh, I guess the uh, Google is the, the really popular, uh, you know, learning space. So they were, you know, they couldn't do two-factor authentication because not yet. I guess it's probably a year away when kindergartners will have uh, mobile phones, but you couldn't really do two-factor authentication with them. So how do we get them to make a strong password? So we, <laughs> this is a site that's out there, DinoPass. Dot com. It will actually generate simple or strong passwords. So it's, you know, it's got the cool blue dinosaur and, and it's, you know, it's fun for kids and you kind of turn it into, you know, it's a, it's a fun site, but yet it's doing something that they can hopefully remember. And that's kind of one solution we came up for, for kids, but it really does apply for adults as far as making that strong password and that still being an important thing here in 2020. Hey Joe, it's Liz. We do yeah. have a question um, when it comes to passwords. Okay. So the question is how secure is it to have my password saved into my computer automatically like so many of us rely on? Can you explain? Yeah, that's, I mean, it's, uh, it's not a great thing. 
However, web browsers like Google Chrome and uh, Microsoft Edge, which is based on Chrome, they have built in some protections for those saved passwords. So they are stored, but they're stored in an encrypted manner. So that's not an awful thing, but it's not something that's portable. That's just dependent on you using your device. Like if you, you know, unless you're taking your device to work or something like that, or, you know, you, it, it makes it a little more difficult than a password manager, but those have really improved in the security. But again, it's not real portable as far as across your devices. That's the only thing I'll say. So hopefully that answered the question. But. It does, thank you. Yep. I wanted to talk a, a minute though, since we are adults, I think, I, don't, I doubt if we have any uh, kindergartners on, online uh, that, are, that are manufacturers. So two-factor authentication, what is that, right? Well, I, I touched on a little bit with your, my email example, um, but two-factor authentication, it adds that layer of protection, right? Because it's not just something you know, it's also something you have, right? It's whether it's sending a text to your phone, which again, that is not as secure as if it is sending a code to an application. So there's a couple applications. So for Microsoft, it's called Microsoft Authenticator. For a lot of applications, they use Google Authenticator. So it's free app. And basically it has the number that changes, right? Every 60 seconds. And as part of your login, put your username and password and then you're prompted for that number. You've got to go to your, your mobile phone and, and see what that number is and input that. That's a little more secure than getting it texted to you. Um, but that is what we refer to as two-factor authentication. Back in the old days, since I'm an old guy, right? I'm a, I'm a senior analyst, so the senior is I'm old. Um, you used to have to carry around a little device, right? That had a number, it was, called an, it was called an RSA secure ID. And they actually used those for a while uh, to get into military bases. So it had a code that changed every 60 seconds, but I'm dating myself because that's really before cell phones became so ubiquitous as they are now. So, but two-factor authentication. For email, I don't understand why you wouldn't turn it on. It has matured a lot. You're not prompted every time you use your email. It's basically when you go through the web browser and not Outlook, the application, and that's true on your mobile device. That used to not be true, and it used to be a bit cumbersome, but it is, it's very easy to implement, and it's very easy to use. Um, it is built into Office 365. It's built into Google. So it's not, I have to pay more for this. And it protects you from somebody that gets tricked and gives away their username and password. Well, without the two-factor authentication, the, the bad guys cannot get in. So it is really an excellent layer. And I will go beyond this, not just for your email, but to be honest, any application you use, especially web-based, that offers two-factor authentication, like your banking, something like that, you should turn it on. It is an excellent protection and will help you sleep a little better at night. So, um, Joe, we have another question. Yeah. Um, and it's definitely surrounding the same subject matter, but it's in relation to insurance companies. Are liability insurance companies gearing up for protection policies, cyber protection policies? Yeah. So, so three years ago, that answer would be no. There were not a lot of uh, what's called cyber insurance available um, from a lot of different carriers. Today, as it stands, I would be very surprised if the the carrier you insure your business through did not have some type of cyber policy rider that you could that you could attach. And again, it's not it's just like any insurance. It's not going to make you 100% whole. But like the example I gave you, that it cost that company out of the blue thirty thousand bucks to get back 
on their feet, well, you may not have 30,000 bucks laying around just to, you know, just to spend on that. And then also some of the policies will cover a part of the ransom, although that's a little controversial, right? The FBI doesn't, and the government doesn't want you to pay ransom. Uh, they feel like that encourages the criminals to keep on doing it, which it does. But I'm going to put my business hat on. And if that's the only way I can get my critical data back, and that's my choice is pay the ransom or go out of business, I'm probably going to try to pay the ransom. So you've got to look at the policy because they are all a little bit different. But we do recommend that you look into cyber insurance these days. As a, it's just another, it's another control, right? It's another um, thing to help lower your risk. And that's what it's all about. So. That's super helpful. And I also I'll add that I've heard that you can get some insurance um, reduction based upon certain cybersecurity protocols or certain things that you have in place for your business. So we so, can always share more after. And well, that, and that's, a, that's, a, so that's a really good uh, point that you make there um, because um, some cyber insurance will come with the caveat that yes, we'll, we'll do that, but you need to show us your latest risk assessment. And like Liz was alluding to, show us what controls you have in place. Do you have a firewall in place? Are you patching your devices? You know, are you, do you have antivirus or malware protection in place? Are you training your employees? Things like that are very common, uh, you know, requests when you go to get cyber insurance. So it's just something to keep in mind. Um, and I think I, I touched on this a little bit, but I just wanted to emphasize because a lot of folks, I know small businesses, they may even still be going down to Best Buy and buying, you know, six or seven computers and setting them up and whatever's on them at the time, that's what they're using for their, for their antivirus and why that, that is not really keeping up with today's threats. And again, I touched on this earlier, but the, the, the traditional antivirus is what's called signature based. So it depends on detecting specific code of malware to stop it and to block it, right? But these guys, they're working nine to five and they are, some of them are very smart and unfortunately have decided to, to be criminals, um, but they will code malware a little bit differently where antivirus can't detect it they actually have labs of computers with different antiviruses to make sure their malware will get past it. So, you know, these guys are not, you know, 300 pounds and in somebody's basement. These guys are well-funded, organized criminals. So they're operating as such. So that's why antivirus doesn't do very much to stop ransomware. That's why you, it's really in the news and you hear about ransomware because the the hallmark of ransomware is, okay, somebody clicks on something that gets on their machine. If I don't have anything to stop it, one of the first things ransomware, one of the, one of the behavioral pieces to ransomware is it's going to try to move laterally to all the devices that are connected on that network. So that's how it spreads. That's why people have these, this catastrophic data loss because all their data has been encrypted by ransomware. That's what it means. That's how it works. So there's a lot better alternatives these days than traditional antivirus. Windows Defender, which comes right, right out of the box, right, for your Windows 10 devices, it's actually better than many of your paid commercial antiviruses. So that's something to keep in mind because it comes with the computer you buy if you're buying a Windows computer. Um, but um, really what we move to recommending is uh, is kind of the next generation, if you will, an antivirus. It's called EDR for short, but that stands for Endpoint Detection and Response because it combines the best of what AV antivirus did. So it does have a signature-based detection and response, but it also looks for behavior. So the behavior of the malware, remember I said ransomware has a very distinct behavior where it's going to try to move laterally. That's a behavior. That's not code necessarily, right? So it can detect 
that attempt to move laterally and say, this doesn't look like a normal program. I'm going to kill it. I'm going to quarantine it. I'm going to, and then I'm going to notify somebody. So I'm going to do that automated response to stop it, right? So it, it works and performs much better than your traditional antivirus. It is like anything else that's better, it's gonna be a little more costly, right? So traditional antivirus, um, if you paid for it, it's maybe about $2 a machine. So you're talking endpoint detection and response can be three to four times that. But again, it offers a much better level of protection against the, the modern uh, threats that are out there. And then the last thing I want to touch on, and again, you can automate a lot of this. Some of it's more difficult than others, but your operating system, right? Windows, the Patch Tuesday, hopefully everybody's familiar with Patch Tuesday, right? They just had a big one uh, this month uh, with a really severe uh, defect in Windows. So, you know, hopefully you're patching your devices. And I'm not just talking about the computers, I'm talking about your servers that house your data, right? Um, we really should be uh, patching those. You know, if you have a large environment, hopefully you have some type of management tool that you're using to make sure those systems are getting patched in a timely manner. One thing a lot that's overlooked in, in small, medium businesses is besides Windows, you probably have a lot of other dis different systems in your environment that are running Linux, that are running things like virtualization platforms like VMware, uh, like Citrix. You all probably have firewalls, maybe Cisco or Meraki uh, or Fortinet. Those all have their own updates and they don't come with the Microsoft patching, right? They have their own patching. So somebody needs to be paying attention to those. And then also besides your operating system, just on your desktop, you need to be very aware that third party applications that are on every desktop, they're targets too, because they're on every desktop. So like your web browsers, Adobe PDF Reader and Java, those are the very three very popular third party applications that have exploits written for them because the bad guys know everybody's got them. Everybody's got them on their computer. So when you think about patch management, you have to really go beyond just the operating system, but if nothing else, you have to make sure the operating system is getting those, those critical security patches and they do come out once a month, so. So it's Liz again. We have a question. You know, I think uh, this question has to do more with um, people who are doing work with the Department of Defense, which I know we didn't really cover today. But the question is, DOD uses class three root cert certificate authorities for medium assurance, and they're looking for help with that. So that sounds like it might, you might be able to give us more idea of whether or not CMMC might be replacing something with that? Well, I mean, um, it, 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 that is a really specific uh, question about uh, Department of Defense subcontractors. So that, again, uh, it's probably a little beyond the scope of this talk, but I'm certainly willing to get somebody's contact information or reach out to them. Um, and just real quick, um, the Department of Defense is launching a new requirement that is actually going to be an auditor that is going to go to the Department of Defense subcontractors and audit against security controls. And this really stemmed out of about two, two and a half years ago where we uh, rolled out our new uh, newest fighter jet and about a week later, China had the exact copy so uh, for years and years, Department of Defense subcontractors had a list of security requirements that they would self attest to. So it was basically a checkbox. And some of it was very complicated questions that probably a lot of people didn't understand very well and responded that, sure, we're doing that because they, you know, that's 
a prerequisite to keep a contract with the DOD. So the DOD said, well, we got to put these standards in place and have them audited. So that's what we're talking about there when we talk about CMMC. But I'll be happy to address that specific question kind of offline, if that's OK. And I think we, uh, we had a, a previous presentation a little bit on CMMC. And I'm sure that um, like Advantage Kentucky Alliance, we work directly with them for folks that have those specific questions. So we can certainly help you with it. And I just wanted to touch on, uh, we talked about cybersecurity awareness training. So we probably need to put our, our uh, money where our mouth is here. There is a free uh, kind of cybersecurity training module that if you will send an email to that cybersafe at the AME group.com, we can get you set up with. It is uh, pretty easy to set up. It, do, it does take about 45 minutes for the user to go through and complete the training and then take a quiz. Um, and the, uh, the manager at your business can then see those reports of who's taken the training, how they did, maybe where they need to you know, help the, their staff with. Uh, so there, that's something that we offer. And then there's also a uh, subscription to weekly security tips there at the bottom. The, uh, that's a website, the amegroup.com, that's us. And then it's uh, slash my dash security dash tip. And you can actually subscribe to our free weekly security tips. And those are actually very helpful and beneficial and very applicable to small, medium business. So um, I did want to finish up real quick here with my how to get a hold of me. Uh, we have an 800 number <clears throat> up there, but one of the easiest ways that goes to uh, a group of us that work in security, and uh, I'm among them. So you can just uh, hopefully remember security at the AME group.com, and that will get questions directly to us. We're always happy to, you know, help. Uh, you know, if it's a quick question, if it's a, hey, we need a proposal because we need help, we're always uh, welcome to and available to entertain those questions as well, because I mean, that's, you know, some of the services that we provide, right? So, um, and with that, that's really what I had for you this afternoon. Um, I appreciate you guys uh, hanging in there with me and, and your attention. All right, thank you. Thank you, Joe. So, having a little bit of difficulty getting it off of mute, but let's see. I um, want to thank everyone for joining us, for joining us today. Um, just a last, let's see. One last thing to um, share. If you have any further questions, again, um, please ask them. We'll be sending out a survey at the end um, or later today that you can ask any other questions that you may have. And um, if, you, if you missed any of the contact information and would like to get that, we, would, we, we can send that out for you. Um, and just as, a, just as a reminder, we have several other uh, webinars coming up we wanna let you know about. Am I, my screen is not working here. So just give me a minute. Let's see. Try this one more time. Okay, so our upcoming events, you can find them on our webpage. Um, that's advantageky.org. We have, um, let's see, there we go. We have one on October 29th. It will be a two-part webinar about supply chain risks and key performance indicators. Um, then we have one on November 5th 
on getting the paperwork right, export documentation. That one we will be discussing basic documentation involved in a typical export transaction. And then we have on November 19th, our food safety. We'll be discuss discussing food safety regulations and certification standard requirements. So you can visit our website to register for those or send me an email for more information. And we'd like to thank you again for joining us today and um, hope everyone has a great afternoon. Thank you. Bye, thank you. Thanks, thanks, thank Kim. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. So, um,